Hey, Central Life, what an honor and joy to be with you once again. I love being your pastor. I love that you've made this your church home. I'm looking forward to so much that God has for us in the future. This time of year, I love to pause and I love to remind myself, maybe you do as well, of what our primary purpose in life really is about. It's about making a difference in the lives of other people. It's not just seeing ourselves as someone to be blessed by God, but it's seeing ourselves as someone that God is willing to reach through to reach other people. And uh, what, a, what a pleasurable and joyful place to be in life to know that truth. I hope that you're confident of it. I hope you're excelling in it. One of the things that helps us as a church do that even better is that we finish every year with a special gift, a financial gift, an offering that goes above and beyond our normal tithes and offerings to accelerate the vision of our church. You can read all about that at centrallife.org slash legacy. So go check it out. We articulate for you how this gift really does propel our ministry into the future. It's not, a, it's not a gift to go backwards, but a gift to go forward. And so check that out. It culminates on December 8th. So if you'd like to give to that, please consider asking God, how do you want me? How do you want our family to contribute this year? You know, I will tell you this, that there is no numerical goal. But last year, our church family of two locations at the time gave $88,000 to this year in gift. And it resulted in the launch of a new campus and many other things to bless the people of our community and abroad. And so I pray that you would consider how you could play a role in this and how you could contribute with us, make a sacrifice this Christmas season to see the work of God's gospel and ministry go forward through Central Life. I love you so much. Thanks for giving me your time. I hope you enjoy part three of the Lineage series. Thanks for being a part of the family. All right, well, hey, good morning, good evening, whatever hour it is that you're with us today. Welcome to church. We're so glad that you're here in the house, whether you're live in the room with me today or uh, you're on one, at one of our venues uh, at another location or you're watching online. Hello to all of our campuses, Oceanside and Pineda and Coco West, as well as our friends in Kingman, Kansas. Shout out to all of our friends in Kingman. We're so glad that you're here today. And uh, we're in a series right now titled lineage, lineage. We're talking about the family of God. We're talking about the fact that you have not just an earthly family, but that God destined you for an eternal family. Your eternal family is, is really the focus of this series and really helping us understand what the big picture is when it comes to God's word and his redemptive plan. We want to understand in this season right now, we want to understand what is it that God has invited us into what are what is the pathways of the journey that he wants to walk us through that is the markers, the qualities, the, the, um, the values of being a part of the family. That's what we're talking about. And so there's this lineal descent from an ancestry in your life. And I've been trying to present to you that there's also a faith one, not just an earthly one, there's a faith one. And so that's what we're talking about. And, and just to, to catch everybody up and to summarize, here's, the, here's what we've been talking about. There's four major principles that we see in God's word repeated from Genesis through Revelation. In all of those places, in all of those, in every text, there's, there's always these four that keep repeating. And they are invitations of God. And here's what they are, just to summarize. Know God is the first one. He wants a relationship with you. The second one is that God invites you to freedom. He wants you to find and discover freedom. And uh, we're gonna spend most of our time today talking about that very step uh, the third is he wants you to understand that redemption is possible, and we define that as discovering purpose in life. We say it this way, the best and greatest day of your life was the day you were born. You arrived here. I mean, what could compete with that? If that didn't happen, you wouldn't be here. You'd have no other days. The second greatest day of your life is the day you find out why. There's a purpose on your life that's God-breathed that he envisioned for your life. And then finally, there's an invitation from God to make a difference with your life. And those four things are really principles of God, invitations of God to the purposes he has for you and to be a part of this family, this family called the body of Christ, the, the bride of Christ, this relationship that's ongoing now for thousands of years that he's been creating. So we're talking about that and we're digging into it. And what I hope that you see what I really hope you see that, that brings clarity to you is that our church is structured around those principles. 
We want you to walk in those pathways because they're God-designed pathways. So for every one of those principles, we have an environment that has its primary purpose is to see you grow in one of those four invitations. Today, I want to talk to you about freedom. I want to talk to you about finding freedom. And just so that we're all on the same page, last week we talked about knowing God, beginning a relationship with him. Today is slightly different. And I know that in our Christian faith, sometimes people struggle with the difference between salvation and freedom or salvation and being delivered. Sometimes we mix the two in a way that we misunderstand what they are. So I wanna bring clarity to that. And then we're gonna dive into the freedom part really deep. Okay, so follow with me. I want to read to you from a text in just a moment, but I want to make this qualifying statement that when God brought salvation to you and you began a relationship with you, God saved you on his own. And what I mean by that is God did not need you to do the saving or to play a part in that saving. He did it on his own. So let me show it to you in the Bible just briefly so you get the, the, the contrast between these two, the difference between salvation and freedom or salvation and deliverance. It says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. It's a gift. In other words, you didn't, You didn't earn this thing. You didn't perform for it. God saved you on his own as a gift to you, his grace. Salvation is not a reward. It's not effort-based, not performance-based. It's not a reward for the good things you've done so that none of you can boast about it. In other words, what God wants us to know is that salvation and the work of salvation belongs to him alone. But the second thing, the second thing that that I want to point out to you today is there is a pathway of deliverance that's different and God expects your participation in that step. Salvation was his and his alone, but freedom is you and him together. In fact, we're going to learn that it's more than just you and him, it's you and other people together. But here's what the scripture says about it. Just so it's clear to you, Philippians chapter 2, verse 12, work hard to show the results of your salvation. And uh, here's, the, here's the dilemma, and here's where we get hung up in our Christian faith and in our walk with God, is that we know that salvation was God alone, and it almost gives us a little bit of a, a deterrence from trying hard because we, we don't want to be guilty of trying to work our way into God's favor. And, and we know that it was him alone. But because of it, sometimes we abdicate our responsibility to work hard. Work hard to show the result, the Bible says, of your salvation. Work hard. And, and it unpacks it for us. Obeying God. Here's how you work hard. Obey God with deep reverence and fear. For... God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. In other words, your work matched with God's work in you is going to produce a freedom for you that he deeply intends and desires for you. And it's going to be awesome. We need freedom today. And so here's my disclaimer to you. My disclaimer to you is this, that freedom is not a step For people who are deeply troubled, freedom is a step that God invites and hopes and expects for all people to journey with him in. It's not for people who are just having these habitual sins and they can't break it. It's not for just drug addicts. It's not for whatever that filter is in your mind to go, oh, I I mean, deliverance, that's kind of a heavy term. I don't really need deliverance. I'm saved. No, no, no. You need deliverance from the things that separated you from God, that required for you to, to have relationship with him, that trust would have to take place. Like there's some things in you. And we, we always reference here at Central Life, I always reference for you the Israelites leaving Egypt. God saved them from Egypt, but he had to deliver them by removing Egypt out of their life once they were were outside of it physically. 
In other words, it took, and by the way, it took 40 years. It took 40 years for God to remove and deliver them from their sin and the Egypt that was in them that they carried out of that. There's a process. There's a journey. It doesn't happen overnight. You can have salvation immediately because it's God's work on your behalf. But deliverance is an everyday occurrence of surrender that you walk with God through. There's this fantastic text in the New Testament. And um, Jesus is the centerpiece of this text in Matthew 11. And in Matthew 11, some interesting things take place. But I just want to highlight for you, kind of summarize. Jesus has sent his disciples out to preach and to minister to these communities all through northern Israel, all around the Sea of Galilee. And they're going out preaching and they're, they're healing people and they're doing the work that he was doing. And they're an extension of that. And as he goes about doing that, some time passes and some of those towns he went to, some of them, they not only received the miracles that he brought and that his disciples brought, but they repented of their former way. In other words, they... They, they pursued true deliverance with Jesus and became followers of Jesus by, by surrendering and, and setting aside the things that had bound them up and turning to Jesus as their answer for all things. And, and then there were towns and cities, and he warns them. He says, there are some towns and some places. He names them. He actually names the cities, and he says, you did not repent. You received my miracle you received the revelation of who I am. You received the good thing I was willing to do for you. But once I did, it ended there and you did not turn to me. And he makes this astounding statement at one point. And, and he says, there is one of you, there's one of you, I, like it was his hometown, Capernaum. He says, you've been raised up to the heavens, but you're gonna be, you're gonna be taken down to Hades. That's the word for hell. Because he says, you refuse to repent. You refuse to turn from the sins that bound you up in the first place. And he makes a comparison to Sodom, which you might know about in the Old Testament, Sodom and Gomorrah, which was destroyed for their sin. Supernaturally, God just wiped it out. He said, it, if, if I'd have performed the miracles I performed in your town in Sodom, it would still be in existence today. It's pretty profound. And so here's what Jesus, here's why I bring that up. Here's why I bring that up in this subject matter. Jesus makes an invitation for you and I to repent. And to understand repentance best is to attach the word turn to it. Turn to Jesus. Turn to him. What do I turn to him with? You know, sometimes we think repentance is about turning from something. It's more about turning to something than it is from something. God invites you to turn your life over to him. And by doing so, by default, you turn away from the things that separated you from him. And so Jesus gives this warning. Repentance is a gift to you. It is an invitation to you. Accept it. Receive it. Come close to me. And then he actually unpacks what repentance looks like. And I want to show it to you today because I think the step of repentance is the beginning of deliverance for every person. And that's what I want to focus on today. If you look with me at Matthew 11, Matthew chapter 11, Jesus has already given the warning in verse 28. Here's how he unpacks the how of repentance. How do I repent? It says this in verse 28, come to me. That's the first thing. Re re repentance is who you're turning to or what you're turning to, first and foremost. Jesus says, come to me. In light of your sin, in light of what you're dealing with, in light of the strongholds in your life, turn to me. Come to me, all who are weary, it's the first thing, and burdened, the second. And what you'll find is, he says, I will give you rest. Three very important things that Jesus outlines in the process of repentance. He says, bring your weariness to me. Bring your burden to me. I want to unpack those words for you just for a moment. Let's do a little Bible study together, okay? So to do a Bible study, we take a word, and we want to unpack what does that actually mean. I know what weariness means. I'm sure you know what it means. But from the text and from the original language, do we know what it means. Weariness is actually, in the Greek language, that word that was used there, it actually means to be burdened to the point of complete exhaustion. Burdened to the point of complete exhaustion. 
In other words, like there's nothing left. I have nothing left to give. I gave it all. I gave all my strength. I gave all my effort. I gave everything I had, and I have nothing. In the Hebrew language, there's the word weariness that's quoted throughout the Old Testament, places like Isaiah 40. And weary means, in the Hebrew language, working against such large obstacles that the body and soul are used up. Now, let me tell you what happens with your weariness. You're living life, and you're carrying burdens, and you're pushing through, and you're striving and man, I'm trying, and I'm gonna show God how worth it I am, and I'm gonna do things right, and I'm gonna do better next time. And, and you know what, all along we get weary and to the point of exhaustion, and then when you're exhausted, you know what, you know what happens? We turn to the wrong thing. We turn to the thing that actually b- binds us. Here's what happens in Christian faith, for those of us who are walking with Jesus, is we know what honors God, and so we try really hard to live that out, but when we live it out in the wrong direction, in our own strength, we get weary, and then what we do is we turn to the things that were formerly burdens as the coping mechanisms for our weariness. And all along, Jesus is saying, no, 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 time out. Bring your weariness to me. Bring your exhaustion to me. Rather than be exhausted and turn to the things that are burdens, and the word burden in this text actually means in, the, in, in this context, it's, a, it's, it's actually the word for um, a shipping freight, like a load, an actual load that you carry in shipping. And it had some nautical um, correlation because there's a lot of shipping that went on across the Mediterranean in this part of the world. And the Greek language, it unpacks the word burden. That's the root for it. In other words, some of us are carrying a load of guilt. Some of us are uh, carrying a load of shame. Some of us are carrying a, 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 a habitual sin. And it is a burden on us that you were never meant to carry. And that's why Jesus says, why don't you come to me and give it to me? Sometimes we're reluctant. I can't, give Je- I can't give Jesus my sin. I have to give him my best behavior. I have to give him, I, I have to clean it up and then I can come to Jesus. Then I can, then I can come to him and say, look, I'm good. I'm, we're good. Everything's gonna be fine. No, no, no. Jesus says repentance is about coming to me in the state you're in so that the result can be rest. And I promise you this, Jesus will give you rest like no other rest can impact your life. Jesus give you rest. And, and, then, and then he says, it'll be, pro, it'll be more than just reactive what I give you, rest. I'll give you rest from that weariness and burden. I'll give you a new yoke. And so what is that, yoke? Yoke in this context is, is not breakfast. You know, it's, it's, it's actually, you know, a mantle that's put on, it's an instrument put on oxen, a lot of times for farming, and they take two oxen and they put them on the same yoke, and it's alignment for the sake of purpose. Jesus says, if you'll come to me, if you'll really understand what true repentance is, it's turning to me, then the result is not only gonna be rest, but proactively, I'm gonna work in you. What did, what did Paul say in Philippians? We just read it a few moments ago that you work hard to show the result of your salvation, not to be saved, but to show the result. And God will work in you to help you do what pleases him. And Jesus says, if you'll come to me, you'll get rest, which is a reactive, it's a reaction to your striving and your struggling and your fumbling and your tripping over yourself. It's a, it's a reaction to that, but I'll give you something proactive too. And that is I'll give you alignment for the sake of purpose. And God knows, God knows to get you to a place of freedom. He has to actually link you up with someone who knows what freedom actually is. And Jesus says, I know what freedom is and I can give it to you. But see, this is, this is why Jesus is revolutionary in the way that he speaks, in the way that he lives, in the way that he gives example, because we think freedom is this unbridled, unhitched, I am on my own, I get to make my decisions, I get to make my choices, and God says, no, 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 actually freedom is being linked up, attached to, and in alignment with those who know what freedom actually is and how to get you there. 
And so freedom isn't independence. Freedom is actually dependence on the right thing. And independence is a smokescreen. But we love independence in our country. It's just that we can't mix it up and get it wrong. Freedom is about depending on the right thing. And Jesus says, you know what the right thing is? Me. Jesus says, I'm the right thing. And he says, he qualifies his yoke as easy and light. Easy and light. Isn't that awesome? So here's what I'm trying to say to you today. There isn't a human being walking the earth that did not need the message of Matthew 11. There's not a single person ever born, past, present, or future, who did not need to embrace the invitation to discover freedom on God's terms instead of our own. Every one of us. Every one of us. So how do I do it? How do I, how do I not only turn to Jesus, but what is the active faith of that look like? That's where I want to take you today. I want you to leave this room. I want you to leave the auditorium you're in and watching from today. I want you to, I want you to leave your house today if you're watching from home. I want, you to, I want you to move into the rest of your week knowing what are the steps of active faith that show I'm a repentant person that produce in me this freedom that God has desired. Because listen, we're not here to learn something about the Bible. We're here to live the Bible. We're not here to learn new thoughts or new ideas and go, that's interesting. We're here for not information transfer, but for transformation in our life, which means we've got to participate in this active work of freedom that Jesus has offered to us. So I wanna walk you through a few things. If you'd look with me, it'll be on the screen. I encourage you to take notes. But what does an active faith look like in pursuing freedom. It means I repent for a few reasons, okay? I want to unpack it for you in my own words, but I want to give you some good anchors from God's word that will help you see what the value of Jesus' invitation was. In other words, we studied Matthew 11 for a couple minutes. I want to show you how to take active steps and give you some cross-references. That means other places in the Bible that will reaffirm that and help you understand how to walk in it. We pursue freedom and repentance. We want to be delivered by Jesus, and we go to him because there are some things that we do to ourself that harm us, that bound us up. That's the first thing I want you to write down. You need to be free from the things you've done to you. Some of us have done some really awful things to ourselves. Pastor Randy last week took the second part of our, our series and, and Pastor Marnus, and they both co-taught that with me. And, and I love what Pastor Randy mentioned to us. He said, you know, if you talk to your friends like you talk to yourself, some of you wouldn't have any friends left. There's just some things we do to ourselves that we actually put bondage on ourselves for the way that we act against ourselves. Let me show it to you in, in God's word, Romans 7. See if you can relate to this at all. See if you can relate. It says, Romans 7, verse 21, I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. I love his word. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. There's a war. A war between God's love and God's truth and the sin that's inside of me. And, and here, here's... Here's what it says. I'm a prisoner. And then he says this. What a wretched man I am. What a wretched person I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ, our Lord. In other words, I can tell you right now, there are some things represented in, the, in our church family today, in our very rooms, in, in these auditoriums. There are some of you walking through life and you are carrying a burden, a load of sin that you weren't meant to carry. And you, in your, in your frustration of not measuring up and getting weary in life, you keep returning to that burden. You're repenting 
but your repentance is towards the wrong thing. And as you keep returning to that, what you're actually doing is you're giving in to the war within you and you're taking the loss. You are the collateral damage of your choice to sin. You are. And you need set free from it. Some of you today, as I talk to you that way, you squirm a little bit in your seat. Because there's a fear within you that maybe, maybe I'm going to get really mad. Maybe I'm going to, uh, the pastor's going to get angry. He's going to yell about it. I'm not going to yell about it. Some of you squirm because you know this hurts, but nobody knows about it. And man, if they knew about it, all my credibility would be lost. I might lose my family over it. I might lose some money because of it. I might lose some reputation and perception of who I am. I'm just telling you, you with your mask off is a whole lot better with you with your mask on. You know why? God can't bless who you're pretending to be. He can't. He won't. How could he? The pretend you isn't real. And you're carrying secrets that nobody knows about and they don't need to be secrets anymore because as long as you carry them, you will be as sick as your secrets. God can't, God can't bless your selfie. You know, that, you know how you take your, we all do this, right? I got my phone right here, this would be great. You know, you take your phone and you take this selfie, but you never, first of all, you never take a sef- selfie from this angle, right? Never, never. Right? Because if you take a selfie from here, you have 16 chins. You know what I mean? Like, you don't do that. That's not how you do it. You don't, you don't even take a selfie from here. You take a selfie like from up here. You know what I'm saying? You'd be like, mm, and, and then you, and I don't even know how to do the right face to make myself look any more gorgeous than I am. But you, but you can. You can. But guess what? That ain't you. And we know that's not you. Because we've stood next to you. Your photo looks kind of like you, but that ain't the real you, right? Listen, some of us, some of us are presenting to the world around us something deeper than just a selfie as our pretend us. It's our mask. It's our avatar. And God can't bless it. He won't because he doesn't, he doesn't bless things that aren't real, I'm just telling you, man, I hope that Central Life continues to, to be a place where you feel, you feel that following Jesus and presenting to him your sins, you will be accepted in this family. I hope that you feel that. I hope that you know it and you trust it. Can I just tell you something? There are prayer team members in our church. There's a, there's a dream team with lots of veins throughout our church and branches. And one of them is our care and prayer team. And every week they pray over the prayer requests that come in this place. Sometimes it's secrets. Sometimes it's cards with no names, but it's their secrets. You know, we've been praying over you. We have, but can I tell you something? Today might be the day that you go to that that care and prayer team, which happens every week after every service. We are ready to minister to you and you begin to say, this is what's going on in me and I can't go on any longer unexposed. I've got to talk to somebody. You need that kind of freedom. The second, the second reason why we repent and we accept the invitation of Jesus and, and pursue an act of faith is because you need freedom from the things others do to you. That's the second thing. It's not just the stuff you do to one another or to yourselves. It's the things that other people do to you. In other words, you need some healing from the wounds. You need some healing from the wounds of what someone else brought into your life. And can I tell you that our natural instinct is to seek revenge, it's to maybe isolate, it's to kick back, it's to fight, it's to condemn them for the things that they did. And and you know what? The natural way is not the best way. The supernatural way is. I wanna show you what God's word says about, this is why you need Jesus, this is why you need to work hard to show the result of your salvation so that you can connect with the work God is doing in you to do what pleases him. Here, here's, the, here's a couple of texts for you to frame this in. Um, a brother, Proverbs chapter 18, verse 19, I love this proverb, it says, a brother offended is harder to be one than a strong city. And contentions are like the bars of a citadel. In other words, when there is tension and there is is a, a bombshell goes off and there is a fight or there is an attack and somebody damages you, hurts you, wounds you, the offense, the offense can actually become your prison. It can actually become the thing that 
binds you up and forces you into a place of slavery rather than the freedom that God has for you. So here's what we have to do, and this is a leap. Can I tell you it's a leap? So you have to walk in it step by step, day by day with Jesus and learn how to do it well. Luke chapter six, Jesus said in verse 27, I say to you who hear me, love your enemies. No, that's not what I wanna do. It's probably not what you wanted to do. Last time you got wounded, last time somebody sucker punched you <laughs> emotionally, <laughs> right? You didn't want to love. Jesus says, I have a new standard. The standard is love your enemies. Love them. Do good to those who hate you. Do good. Notice something, that to love an enemy and to do good to them is not, is not what it doesn't say. What it doesn't say is be a victim to them. It doesn't say make yourself vulnerable to them. It says love them. It says respond with good when they hate you. In other words, I think what Jesus is saying is just because they came to wound you doesn't mean that you wound them back. And here's, here's what it continues on. It says, bless those who curse you and pray for those who mistreat you. Few things will impact your freedom. Few things will impact your freedom like the feelings that you carry about someone else because they wounded you. It can become your prison. You have to see differently. You have to assume the best. You have to carry on and take the high road. And it will not be easy, but you've been called to work hard to show the result of your fresh. Your, your salvation, and you've been called to work hard so that it will link up with the work that God is doing in you at the same time. You are yoked together with the living God. You are aligned with a new purpose, and you need freedom from those wounds. You know what? It doesn't end there. The last one is, is um, important. It's a huge step, and here's what I want to say to you about it. It's, it's something that we we almost characterize as almost fictitious. And I want you to be careful with that. We think in terms of the devil, not all of us, but some of you think in terms of the devil as an imaginary character, but he's not imaginary. He's very, very real. And the third reason you need to pursue repentance with Jesus is because you need freedom from Satan's attack to stop you. There are things that Satan is doing to stop you right now. What I would like to say to you is this, without scaring you, is that there are demons assigned for your destruction. There is an enemy who is very calculated and strategic about making sure your repentance is always in the direction of the thing that keeps you bound. There are demons assigned for your destruction. And, and here's the thing about it is that if every time you read the scriptures and you open it up and you see something about Satan, you go, oh my goodness, I could not handle that guy. And that is true. You could not. You could not handle Satan. You cannot handle demons. You cannot, you are not strong enough to overcome them. It, and, and yet the beauty is this, Jesus is and already has. And you've been invited to turn to him. You've been invited to go to him. You've been invited to bring your weariness, your burdens, your sin, your pursuit of rest, your hope for purpose, all of those things that you can't find on your own. You've been invited to bring them to Jesus and let him have the authority over your life. Everything you're thinking about right now is spiritual and every challenge you have is spiritual. Everything you're worried about is spiritual. There is an enemy of God beyond what you do to you Beyond what others have done to you, there is an enemy of God who is so deeply against you, he will do everything he can to keep you harming yourself and harming the people around you and pursuing to divide you from the God who loves you. I think, to, to be real pointed, I think that the list of cities that Jesus named in Matthew 11, which I did not read you the whole list, you can go look at it. I believe that the list of cities on the side that refused to repent were under the constant barrage and attack of the enemy of God who duped them into believing that they could have the miracle of God without the surrender of heart, who believed that they could have true freedom 
without actually anchoring and connecting and hitching their life to Jesus. And I believe that he overpowered them and I believe he worked against them. But you know what? There's an answer for that. There's an answer for it. I want to show, show you in, in God's word that this is real. Ephesians chapter 6 Verse 10 says, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power and put on the full armor of God. God is calling you into a fight is what it's saying. You're in a battle. You should probably put on your bulletproof vest because somebody's going to be shooting at you. You should probably put on the armor that's going to protect you against the attack. And it says this, if you'll put the full armor of God on, you'll be able to stand against the devil's schemes. He's real. There's a battle. You're in it. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. There's a real battle going on. God's not making this up as an analogy or a metaphor for something. God is saying this is real. There's a battle going on that you can't see with the physical eyes he gave you. It's a spiritual battle. And the only way to overcome it, I'm telling you, is to turn to the one who has authority over all of it. It's the only way. It's the only way. God never said that there wouldn't be weapons that form against you. He just made a promise that they wouldn't prosper. You know, what we learn about Satan in God's word is that he was a worship leader. He was heaven's worship leader. It's what he did. That was his role. That was the purpose for which he was created. And he rebelled against God. He sinned himself. He, Satan himself, sinned against God. And he was cast out of heaven. The Bible says, Jesus said, I saw him fall like lightning from heaven. He was cast from heaven. And, and here's the thing. He forfeited his role as the worship leader of heaven. And God's response to that was to create humanity in his image and to bring them into a lineage of faith and ancestry that he wanted to create a family of God and our role in life and our purpose in life begins, does, it begins with the first step of worship. In other words, God gave to you and I the role that Satan forfeited. And he said, everything begins in him and everything will end in praise. You and I were destined to praise God forever in the way that Satan decided to forfeit. And you know why I'm telling you all that? Because I'm telling you that the spiritual battle, the spiritual battle and the putting on of the armor of God begins with your willingness to turn to Jesus and to give him the worship and the praise that he deserves. When he gets what he deserves, you can't be, Satan cannot touch you when you are worshiping God with your life. It ain't gonna happen. He's not come, he's, his weapon will be formed but it will fail because the only weapon he had of any value was the one that God empowered him with, which was the gift to worship, and he forfeited it. Wow. So here's the thing. Here's the thing. You've got to, some of us, some of us need to do a deep dive in God's word about what it means to praise him because some of us are still struggling and, we're, and we have hurdles in front of us and there's this reluctance to verbalize and vocalize what we believe in our hearts, what we know is true here. We struggle to get it out of us in the form of praise. And I think for some of us, that's our first step today is to praise. But let me just kind of summarize this whole thing. Can I just tell you, there is a primary environment that God has led us to create at Central Life to help with the freedom that we all need. And that environment, that environment, along with these steps of active faith, that environment really is about you being in relationship with other people. It's a relationship. That's the key. You need to be yoked. You know what our yoke is, so to speak, at Central Life? It's something called life groups. Life groups are our yoke. It's where we get aligned with great purpose and intention to experience freedom. In other words, you will never experience the freedom that God destined you for until you're willing to link up with people who are pursuing it with Jesus at the lead. That's how it happens. That's how it happens. So if you're not in a life group, 
I want to encourage you. You got to be in a life group. There's active steps that you're going to take. But can I just tell you, all these things I outlined today, the things we do to ourselves, the things that others do to us, the enemy coming against us, do you know how you fight that? And do you know how you pursue freedom in the midst of all of that? You do life with other people. That's why we call it life groups. Life. Life. You need other people. If you don't have it, you're isolated. If you don't have it, can I tell you what's going to happen? You'll repent, but you'll repent to the things, you'll repent to the things that bind you, not the one who frees you. And there's a big difference. There's a huge difference. So I encourage you today to take some steps. I don't know what the Holy Spirit's saying to you, but I'd love to end with that question, if I can, and ask you, what is the Holy Spirit saying to you? I want to invite you actually to stand to your feet today as we close. And uh, as you do that, I want you to consider that question deeply. I think that God has given all of us the opportunity to be in relationship with him so that we could have this kind of access and we could hear the prompting of God to us. I prepared some things for you today, but I think God was preparing some things for you in spite of that or beyond that that are very direct, that he knows exactly how to speak to your heart, and that right now he would speak to you in this moment. So I want you to bow with me, and I want you to just begin to ask that question. Holy Spirit, what what are you saying to me today? What do you want for me today? So I encourage you to let the silence of that sit in for just a moment. Let's just be quiet before the Lord, and let's ask him, God, what are you saying to us today? God, I know that you're leading some of us to take a step in confessing our sins for the first time. Maybe that's the active step today, the active step of faith that is, God, I need to speak to someone today and I need to say, I've been struggling. There's a stronghold in my life and I don't seem to have control anymore. It has control of me. Maybe that's the step for you. Maybe that's what God's prompting you with. Maybe the step for you today is that you need to look at what has been done against you. And although it seems so counterintuitive, maybe God is saying to you, you need to, you need to reconnect with people. You disconnected from people because of what they did to you and how they hurt you. But you can't stop there. You've got to connect with other people. It's in the connection with the people of God the healing will begin to flow. You gotta learn to trust again, maybe is what God is saying to you. You gotta learn to take a step of faith again. You gotta come even with scars and wounds and you've gotta say, man, I'm hurting, I am hurting. That's a big step, but maybe that's a step God's taking, asking you to take today. And maybe the third is, is that you, in spite of all of that, you've just been under the barrage of the enemy. And today, you need to, you need to come under the covering the yoke of Jesus Christ, the one who frees us, who delivers us from the war within. You need to come to him and not stand on your own and keep trying to fight this battle off in your own willpower, your own strength, and realize you are not enough, but with him, you'll have more than enough. So today I want to pray for you with that in mind. God, I pray favor over the Central Life family today. I pray for every person under the sound of my voice today in this room and other, other auditoriums and other places and online, I pray, God, that every person listening today, every person joining me in prayer today would find favor, the favor of God on their life. As we continue to humble ourselves before you, we trust your promise that you will lift us up in due time. And I pray for all of us who have taken the step of believing in your salvation, but have been reluctant or slow to take the step of repentance, that that would be no more. We would heed the warning of Jesus and the invitation of Jesus to come to him fully today, completely exposed, not not just to you, God, but to each other to say, I need some help and I need some direction. I pray, God, for courage to rise up in hearts today. I pray that the things that the enemy stole, you would replace 
I pray the things that we're seeking help for and we're seeking healing from, that you would bring your hand upon our life and you would touch it and you would release your healing power in our lives. God, I ask today that new possibilities would be open to us as we take active steps of faith. I ask that new opportunities, new miracles would begin to flow and that we would live a life of repentance in the midst of it to honor you, to worship you, to glorify you. We love you today. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hey, stand on your feet. Let's continue by singing together. Love you, church.